Don't hold your breath. That's right, that's right. Well, friends, it's good to see you. I hope you yeah, we do need one of those, don't we? Um, I hope you're having a good week. Um, update on Aileen. Uh, she will not be being admitted. Miss Tina's on her way to send her down pick her up. So that is very good news. Um, that's, that's all I know. So now you know everything I know. Uh, but very pleased that Aileen uh, won't be being admitted and is on the way home. So thank you for your prayers and um, uh, certainly very thankful for that. Uh, I spoke to Brenda this morning. Her and Jerry are doing pretty well. She said Jerry is getting uh, stronger. Um, so just staying in, of course. Uh, so do continue to pray for them. Uh, pray for Miss Wendy. These cold days are very, very hard on her, her back and just her general level of, of comfort. Uh, she was in good spirits when I saw her yesterday, getting her uh, grocery shopping in for, for Christmas. So um, it's good to see Miss Wendy do. Uh, pray for Miss Wendy, give her a call. I know she'd love to, to hear from you. Uh, keep praying, of course, for George and Irene Dolan. Um, there's no real kind of update or change in that situation. Um, Brother George, of course, I mean, I guess it's no secret, Brother George himself has uh, his own health needs. He's had a couple of positive uh, doctor's appointments uh, recently where they've been pleased with his uh, status. Um, as, as of Monday night, when I spoke to him last, he had not yet been able to see Irene. Um, so do, uh, do continue to pray for them. Um, it's really hard, isn't it, when someone has uh, dementia or Alzheimer's to, to know how to pray. Uh, but this is where, man, this is where we trust God, right? You know, we know the Lord uh, has ways of ministering and, and communicating through His Spirit um, that you or I are ignorant of. So let's pray that um, the Lord will still be ministering to Irene. Uh, pray the Lord will give George the health he needs to be back with us on Sunday. He really misses being here, and I just think it would do him the power of good uh, to be with us again on a Sunday morning, so do continue to pray for him. Uh, do call Brother George if you get the opportunity. Uh, he would love, hey George, he would love to, uh, to speak to you. Um, yeah, it's always <coughs> encouraging to, to hear from him. Um, other prayer needs, what else do we need to be aware of? Miss Linda. Uh. We need to still continue to pray for um, Jerry and Brenda's sister-in-law, Dee, yes. Max Peak. Yep. And, um, Is she still in the hospital, Ms. Linda, mm -hmm. as far as you're aware? Yes. She was yesterday when I talked to Brenda. Okay. And um, my cousin, Chris Matheny, mm -hmm. she's asking for prayers. She's, I think she said January the 6th or the 7th, she's going to Pittsburgh and have one of her operations reversed and she would like to have prayer okay and then my cousin Beth Lively uh, something must be going on with her and she's not telling her children okay she can't get up by herself her husband has to help her okay. children wanted her to move back to Savannah they told them no so they're gonna have to try to get help for their daddy to help their mother okay goodness all right do you remember those prayers that's really a difficult thing to do to unless you're pretty well off. He's trying to get it he's, he's to trying to get it off in. Oh yeah, yeah, it really is. Yeah, it really is. Right. Yeah, I thought we could continue to pray for uh, Debbie McClellan. Yes, thank you. Know, she'll be having a, what she calls a big surgery on January the 26th of course this coming year. Yeah. Um, yeah, just having a big surgery. Anything else we need to do well? All right. Well, if you think about it, you can pray for the old boy. I went to the doctor Monday and uh, he read me some of the results from the uh, CAT scan I had. I, I have a tumor in where my thymus is. Okay. That's why my thymus is it's supposed to be dormant, but it's uh, enlarged, I guess. Okay. But I have a tumor there. So I don't know what they're going to do about it. Okay, so they did suggest a course of treatment? Well, I have another appointment in uh, March. Just in March. March. Okay. 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 Right. 
Pro for now. Of course, Pro for Tina is, I'm, I'm assuming the road's pretty ugly right now, so Pro for her as she goes out to St. Mary's. She's back. excited. Isn't she? Yeah, I know she was. Uh, anybody else? Well, let me remind, yes, Miss Linda. Can I say something? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, listen, Miss Linda, you can say anything you want, but Miss Paula's not going to listen to you. I just knew she was going to say that. You've, you've seen that for a 50 years, years, haven't you? A long time. I know I've got a birthday coming up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead, Miss Linda. Uh, go ahead. Can I encourage um, the women, maybe, to mail the people that are shut in? Christmas cards, uh -huh. and because I wasn't going to do it, but there's a lady in our church that has not been able to come, and I mailed her one, and she got it Monday, and I don't like texting on that uh, flip phone, mm -hmm. and I got a real sweet thank you from her, yeah. and it said it made her day, she had been down. And it made her day, and I oh, thought it would be good to mail Christmas cards out, or, you know, or either yeah. other, any other kind of card. Yeah, that's lovely. Thanks, Miss Thunder. Mm -hmm. um, I had that same thing happen this week. Yeah. Somebody called and thanked me for a uh, Christmas card, somebody that I hadn't seen in a while, and they said it was just real brightening for that day to get a Christmas card from me. Good. Yeah. Uh, listen, in a day of instant throwaway communication, that physical. Uh, mail mm -hmm. becomes even more precious, I think. So that's a really good point. Thank you, Ms. Linda. I tell you somebody that loves to get cards. Mary Smith. Yeah. Any yeah. time in the year, if people send her a card, people will be delighted. Yeah. I send her cards all the time. Yeah. Pastor Reed, you know that back in the day before we were born, people used to... Oh, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. They, uh, you know, it was done for people sent Christmas cards to everybody they ever knew. Yeah, yeah. Right. you know, you yeah. could just get a hundred of them. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it's the same to cheap too. <laughs> right, exactly. It's not to cheap. Did now? Did you have a running? Like mail trucks back then, or was it horses? Yes, horses. Horse. You remember? Know, yeah. <laughs> 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 but Harry's had his hand up this whole time, and people keep. Right. I'm going to be taking some pictures today of the uh, oh, lovely. of the Christmas decorations. Right. If you want, uh, I'm going to make some copies for okay. Miss Mary Smith because yeah. she requested them. I'm going to take them to her. But if you'd like some copies of them, I'll give them to you, and you can hand them out to some folks. Okay. Lovely. I don't know how well I'll do with it, but I'll give it a good try. I'm sure to get halfway job here. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me remind you, this is our final morning manor of 2020. How about that? Yeah. Um, next week, we'll, we will meet Christmas morning, 8.30. Yeah. Um, the following week, we'll meet New Year's Eve at 5 p.m. So Christmas morning, 8.30, um, New Year's Eve, 5 p.m. Both those services, I'm thinking 20, 30 minutes, probably not even that long. Um, so Christmas morning, 8.30, New Year's Eve, um, 5 o'clock. Look forward just to my own Christmas morning coming together and worshipping. I know for a lot of you, your Christmases don't look this year as they normally do, so that's one uh, little bit of normalcy in your, in your Christmas morning routine perhaps. Uh, and New Year's Eve, I just feel like it's the right thing to do to uh, gather together one last time. Thank God for... Uh, sustaining us through 2020 and to, to commit ourselves to him again in 2021. So I commend both those opportunities to you. Anybody else before we pray? All right. Oh, yeah, go for it, Mike. Yeah, uh, continue to pray for Pastor Musisi, uh, the ministerial group that has been ministers, their families. Um, so good things are going to happen. Yeah. I really think so in, in, in evangelism and it's going to be very fun. It's going to be a real movement of the spirit. So, yeah. Now, there's an election coming up in Uganda, right? Am I, is that yes, a presidential election? I'm not sure the timing yeah. of it, but yeah, still looking for an election as well. Yeah, the big part of that as well. All right, Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to uh, conclude our study uh, in this chapter of the Bible.
This morning we're going to read Hebrews 11, verse 30 to verse 40. Hebrews 11, verse 30 to verse 40. Read our passage, pray, and then we'll see what the Lord has for us this morning. So Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down, after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak, and of Samson and of Jephthah, and of David also, and Samuel of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead back to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they may obtain a better resurrection. And others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided something better, some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. Let's pray again. Father, we're thankful that you are the great God, the good God, the talking God, the, the working God, the healing God. Father, we ask for physical healing for those that we've mentioned this morning. Uh, for those in our church family, for those in our physical families, uh, Lord, for those uh, who know you, uh, and perhaps for those who don't know you, Lord, we pray that through uh, the physical discomfort you would draw all those to you. Lord, we're thankful that Miss Aileen is on her way home, Lord, we're thankful uh, for the work that you have done there, and we pray that her recovery uh, would be complete. Lord, we remember those who are uh, facing surgery, we ask that you would keep their minds in perfect peace. Lord, we pray for those who are who are awaiting results of some kind, and we ask that you would continue to keep them in faith, continue to remind them of your love and your promises. Lord, we pray for those who, who maybe are spiritually struggling, physically fine, but, but just feeling far from you, Lord, whether here under this roof or watching at home later on, Lord, as we have prayed for physical healing and strength, we also ask for spiritual healing and strength, for a deepening of our faith, for an increase of our joy. Lord, don't let this Christmas season pass without us uh, spending time to consider uh, and to be amazed again at uh, your love and Father and the gift of your Son. Be with us this morning, uh, we ask, as we consider these last few verses of Hebrews 11, Lord, I pray that and you would humble us, you would encourage us, uh, and you would, again, help us to commit ourselves to you. Father, we love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Remember, the book of Hebrews was written to first-generation Jewish background Christians. These were men and women who had left the Jewish faith and come to worship Christ, come to faith in Christ. But there was a great cost, for you and me, probably an unimaginable cost for a Jewish believer accepting faith in Christ. Turning their back, not only on their ethnicity and their history, but their family and their culture. There was a great cost for Jews to become Christians in the first century. And the book of Hebrews was written to show these new believers that when they followed Christ, it was worth it. To show these new believers that, that when they followed Christ, he could sustain them. That when they followed Christ, he would not let them down. Hebrews chapter 11 shows these 
these Jewish background believers that they are in fact not doing a new thing when they come to faith in Christ, but that they are imitating their ancestors, Abraham and, and Moses. They need to see that the God we meet in the Bible, and only the God we meet in the Bible, is enough to hold our lives, calm our fears, and satisfy our hearts. Friend, Jewish first century believers needed that, and American 21st century believers need it no less. That the God we meet in the Bible, and only the God we meet in the Bible, is enough to hold our lives, enough to calm our fears, and enough to satisfy our hearts. Everything else we pursue is too little. Listen, you don't sin because your desires are too strong. You sin because your desires are too weak. You don't sin because you want to be happy too much. You sin because you don't want to be happy enough. And in the Bible, we meet the only God, the only reality, who can satisfy us for eternity. And we need to know that. We need to believe that. Because just like the first century Jewish believers, believers, our lives mostly are made up of struggle and suffering. If we're honest with ourselves, most of our time we're struggling through a problem, whether it's a significant problem or not, or we're suffering either with a physical ailment or a spiritual <coughs> difficulty. So we need to know that our faith in Jesus is enough. That Jesus can sustain us through struggles. That Jesus can sustain us through suffering. We see in those first four verses there that, that our faith conquers in struggle. Our faith conquers in struggle. Uh, the author to the Hebrews talks about Jericho, verse 30. You know that Jericho was the first major city the children of Israel encountered in the conquest of Canaan. Jericho seemed like an, un, uh, an impossible obstacle to overcome. But do you know what the problem was with Jericho? The problem with Jericho was not the thick walls that surrounded the city, but the thick hearts of God's people who struggled to trust in God's word. But when they acted in faith, when they heard the word of God and obeyed, what happened? The walls of Jericho came down. Faith conquered in struggle. Next we read about Rahab in verse 31. By faith the heart of Rahab Perish not with them that believe not, when she received the spies with peace. Rahab, because of her faith, was not only spared, but honoured with a place in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus. Again, faith overcomes in struggle. Faith conquers in struggle. We don't know really much about Rahab, apart from what we read in the Bible, but we can imagine the inner turmoil that went through her when she had to decide whether to trust in the God of Israel or in the God of her fathers. But Rahab was spared and honoured because of her faith. Her faith conquered in struggle. Verses 32 through 34 tell us of many others whose faith conquered like this. What more shall I say, right? That it's my opinion that Hebrews this book of Hebrews was a, a transcribed sermon, at least the body of it was a transcribed sermon. It may have been sent off as a letter, but this part at least doesn't read like a letter, does it? It reads like a message. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of wine, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, and turned to flight armies of aliens. Many others whose faith conquered like this. Now these would have been familiar names to the original audience, but perhaps they're less familiar names to us. Gideon was a military leader who overcame great odds to lead God's people to victory. Barak was a judge who similarly did the same, taking a much smaller army than necessary to overcome Sisera. You can read about him in the book of Judges. 
we might remember Samson and Jephthah for their famous failures. Samson's bold immorality and Jephthah's foolish vow, whatever you think the, um, the, the content of Jephthah's foolish vow was, it was nonetheless a foolish thing to do. We might remember Samson and Jephthah for their failure, but God remembers them for their faith. Listen, you don't worship a fastidious God. You don't worship a, a list-keeping God. You worship a loving God. Sometimes I think we remember our failures and, and we see our transgressions much more clearly in some ways than God does. Samson and, Samson and Jephthah are included here to remind us that God doesn't remember our failures. God remembers our faith. Who is a, a better example of that than David? David the murderer. David the adulterer. David, if you like, almost the kingdom splitter. David who was far from perfect. But David who ended his life in faith. Samuel's whole life, of course, was a battle against idolatry and immorality. Samuel didn't have to fight armies by himself, but he had to fight a very serious enemy, and that was, of course, peer pressure and the prevailing atmosphere of the culture. Samuel almost stood alone against the idolatry and immorality of his age, and in the end, his faith prevails. Because faith conquers in struggle. Faith overcomes enormous odds. Faith overcomes overwhelming pressure. Faith overcomes devastating failure. Faith conquers in struggle. I think verses 33 and 34 are meant to sort of sum up the whole prophetic ministry. Of course, Daniel is the prophet that springs to mind the most easily from that description. But I think this is essentially what the prophets in the Old Testament did. They subdued kingdoms. They promoted righteousness. Promises were made and kept to them. They stopped the mouths of lions quenching violence, escaping from the sword, made strong in their weakness, fighting and overcoming enemies. Faith conquers in struggle. Whatever people needed, they found through their faith in God. If they needed political victory, they found it through faith. If they needed strength to help those in need, it was given to them by faith. If they needed to believe the promise, God turned up the dial of their faith so that they would believe in God's promises not in the lies of the world. If they needed to overcome enemies, they did by faith. If they needed protection, it was granted to them by faith. Faith conquers in struggle. The Christian life is a looking away from our abilities, a looking away from our failures, a looking away from our circumstances, and a looking to our great God. That was the secret of these men. They didn't look at themselves. They looked at God. How often we judge our own spiritual well-being on our own performance. God the Father never does. He looks at our faith in Christ and is pleased. Faith conquers in struggle. Faith continues in suffering. Verse 35 really sums it up, doesn't it? it not even the whole, the totality of the verse, just the first part. Women received their dead back to life again and others were tortured. How do you sum up the Christian life? Well, women received their, dead for their, their sons back from the dead. Elijah and Elisha both raising widows' sons. And some were tortured. Faith continues in suffering. Sometimes faith alleviates suffering. Sometimes, if we're honest, our faith causes our suffering. Women received their dead back to life again, but others were tortured. Why? Not accepting deliverance that they may obtain a better resurrection. So see that. Elijah and Elisha raised the widow's children on the basis of their faith. Their suffering was ended, or at least alleviated, on the basis of their faith. But some people suffered because of their faith. But faith always continues. In fact, it is in suffering, in the long-term suffering mentioned in these verses, that our faith becomes obvious to us and to those around us. 
when everything's going well in life, who knows what we really trust? Do we trust God or, or do we trust whatever it is that's uh, creating this success in our lives? Do we trust God or do we trust our ability? Do we trust God or do we trust our income? Do we trust God uh, or do we trust the, the fact that things will always continue this way? But when our faith continues in suffering, we can be assured our faith is real. Faith continuing in suffering also shows those around us that our faith is real. When the days are sunny and you can have your lazy afternoon on the boat, no one thinks Jesus is precious to you. They think that the sunny days and the boat are precious. But when you lose everything and persevere in faith, then we know and then we show that it is Jesus who is precious to us. How else could these brothers and sisters endure what we read about in verses 36 and 37? Others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. We can't imagine this. If we're absolutely honest, we can't imagine this. But through this we learn that only the God of the Bible is big enough to sustain you through suffering. Only the God of the Bible is good enough to sustain you through suffering. Only the God of the Bible is big enough to fill our hearts with faith and joy needed to continue in suffering. Friends, we can continue in suffering because God has proven himself over and over and over. The author to the Hebrews says to these first century Jews, tempted to give up on Christ because it's too hard, that God can sustain them. The author says to us, 21st century Christians, tempted to give up because of this reason and that reason and the other reason, he tells us that God is able to sustain us. This is the life, verse 38, of whom the world is not worthy. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You might live in a cave, you might get sawn in two, but it's okay. Because there's a better resurrection to come. There is something to come that makes all this worthwhile. So while Hebrews 11 deals with, with physical persecution rather than physical suffering, I think the same lessons are true. We're tempted to ask God why when we suffer. We're tempted to quit, maybe not when we suffer so much as when those who we love suffer. But what do we see in Hebrews 11? Well, the same lessons are true. Sure, you can quit, but not only will you lose hope in this life, you'll lose hope in the next life too. If you lay down your faith in Jesus, not only do you abandon all hope in this life, you abandon all hope in the next life as well. And it is hope in the next life that sustains God's people through suffering. Finally, we see that faith always looks to salvation. Our faith always looks to salvation. We don't become Christians because we think it will make next week better. Because if the testimony of Hebrews 11 is true, it, it might very well not make next week better. We become Christians, we trust in Jesus because we think and we know and we believe and we trust that it will make our forever better. Faith looks forward to, faith counts on salvation. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. <clears throat> Isn't that amazing? God was pleased with them, but he, they didn't see the fulfilment of the promise. These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having promised some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So, feel the burden just for a second of what the author to the Hebrews is saying, right? He's saying, listen to these great incredible, faith-filled, inspiring stories, and then remember that without you, 
they are not perfect. Because how often are we tempted to say to ourselves, man, if I could just see the stuff that Abraham saw, my faith would, would really grow. If I could just see what, what David saw, I'd never doubt again. Abraham and David are looking at you and saying, oh, if only I could see what you saw, I'd have so much more joy, so much more faith. These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. These Old Testament saints did not live for instant gratification. They didn't power if they were faithful for five hours and life was still hard. No, they kept going, receiving a good report through faith, even though they never received the promise. Some people did. Some people received land and victory in life, but most of them never saw the fulfilment of what God had promised. Whatever these people received in life, they knew that God had something better for them. No matter how good life got under the sun, they knew that God had something even better for them. And verse 40 tells us what it is. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now, whatever can that mean? What does it mean that apart from you, Abraham is not made perfect? Perfect. Well, we know that it can't mean that Abraham's salvation depends on your faith. We know that it can't mean that that David's place in heaven depends on your work. So what does it mean? God provided some better thing for us. That without us, that is, um, without what the Lord has done for us, without what the Lord has done in our time, they wouldn't have received what they were promised. So let's go through that step by step. How do Old Testament saints receive the promise of heaven? Well, the same way you do, through faith in Christ. They look forward, not knowing the totality of the picture. We look backwards, having received a much fuller revelation in the Gospels and in the Old Testament. So those Old Testament saints will not be made perfect without faith in Christ, without faith in what Christ is doing, has done in our age, in our day, in our time, and neither will we, will we be. Christ is working for us in this day. Hebrews, uh, the start of Hebrews tells us that, that when Christ came, the last days started. Last time I got my haircut, um, the lady was telling me about the, you know, all the things that, that have happened this year, um, I guess she thought I needed cheering up and, and she thought and she said to me you know I really feel like we're living in the last days right well yeah absolutely we are we've been living in the last days since Jesus ascended to heaven this is it the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon us at Pentecost and without us without that work without the thing that we have faith in which is the, which is the truth that they have faith in Christ's death on the cross they will not be made perfect so Abraham, David, Moses, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, Gideon, Samuel. They may not have known the full picture of gospel revelation like you and I did, but they knew their faith was in, was in the work of God. They knew their faith was in the serpent crusher promised in Genesis 3 who would come and undo the work of the devil. They looked forward to faith. They looked forward to Christ in we look back to Christ in faith. So what about for us? What are we supposed to see from Hebrews 11? None of us are tempted to go back to Old Testament Judaism, right? And if you are, I'd really like to have a conversation with you. But you and I are tempted to worry. You and I do have a faith that has been shaken. And as we face 2021, there's not much confidence that anything's going to happen out there in the world that's going to increase our faith. As we think about the, the challenges, new and old, the challenges foreseen and unforeseen that 2021 will inevitably bring, as I talk to you about those things, I hear a lot of fear and a lot of frustration 
But what Hebrews 11 teaches us is we need to have a lot of faith. Whatever new virus no one's ever heard of 2021 brings, hey, God is big enough to sustain us. Whatever political madness 2021 brings, God's people have been through worse. And God's people are still here. Whatever temptations you personally face next year, God's people have been through worse. And God has sustained them. Whatever tragedy threatens to overwhelm your family life next year, God's people have been through worse. God has never let them down. So we need to remember that as we close out this year and look forward to next year. You can look forward to what's coming next year and be fearful. You can look forward to what's coming next year and be frustrated. Or you can be a Christian. Look forward to what's coming next year filled with faith. But even though we live in an uncertain world filled with change, we worship a steady, steadfast God. His word is good, who sustains his people, and who in himself will never change. This Christmas time, I want to encourage you to, to just spend some time thinking about the miracle of what Jesus has done for us. What does it tell us about the God we worship? That he came as a baby. What does it tell us about the God we worship? That the Lord Jesus has lived through every stage of life. What does it tell us about the God we worship? That in some ways the Lord Jesus is more human than Adam, right? Adam was never a baby. Adam was never a vulnerable infant. Adam never passed through adolescence. But the Lord Jesus did. So it's easy to talk about celebrating Christmas in our hearts, but instead of that being a cliche, I think that's probably the point of Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 encourages us not to look at ourselves, not to look at our failures, not to look at our fears, not to look at our frustrations, but to look at the great sustaining God who spoke in time and space and who broke into history to rescue his people and to keep on rescuing them. Friends, keep your eyes firmly fixed on Christ this Christmas season and as we face next year and see and feel your faith growing as you do. Let's pray together as we close. Would you pray with me? Lord, who is there like you? The great God who comes, the great God who... Uh, deserves all our worship, the great God who should be uh, absolutely front and centre of our attentions and our affections. Uh, Lord, so often I find myself looking at me and, um, and judging your ability by my ability. Lord, I pray that you would save us from that. Lord, help us not to fear. Help us not to be frustrated. Help us not to worry about our faith. But help us to continue in faith, looking at you trusting in you and waiting for your work. Because Lord, if, if the message of Christmas and the story of Hebrews 11 tells us anything, it's that you're a God who always works. And a God who always works good for his people. Give us the faith to believe it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here uh, this morning. This Sunday morning, you'll be able to take the point setters home with you, uh, if you would like. So if you need to make your car point setter friendly, no, be, I don't know what that involves. We're just going to carry on. So, uh, just be aware of that. Um, Christmas Day, 8.30, New Year's Eve, 5 o'clock, those will be good services. Thank you.